unable or unwilling, and the, sooner we, the more we do that, the more we undermine the respect their people have for them and their ability to do this job for us. So it is counterproductive, it is non-factual, it is not our official position that either Pakistan or Yemen are unable or unwilling. And therefore, we should not be treating them as combat zones. Does your opinion change if uh, Yemen or uh, Pakistan said to the United States, we'd like you to get that guy? No, because the Pakistan and Yemen can only give us the authority that they have to give. And if they are involved in an armed conflict, um, and Pakistan is now trying to clear the Swat Valley of certain Taliban forces, if they ask us to join with them in carrying out that particular action, and really there is a question under law of armed conflict whether named individuals can be targeted and, and brought to bear. Uh, Dean Coe only mentioned one case of this, which was a World War II case involving Justice Stevens, and he regretted having killed a named person. So this is really a question for warriors in, in an armed conflict. The only thing that Pakistan or Yemen can ask us to do in terms of carrying out battlefield killing is to join with them in their own armed conflicts to try to support what they're doing. So if Yemen decided that it was, this was a guy they wanted to have a conflict with, that he was part of some operation that they thought it would have, then they could do it? Yes. And we can certainly help them, and we were helping them after the coal attack, our FBI, people with really good training in Arabic who know, counter, uh, who know terrorism networks, they were working effectively with Yemeni authorities. That's the route we should be pursuing and should have been pursuing in these last years. Thank you. Mr. Flake. Mr. Anderson, uh, uh, Legal Advisor Coe's statement didn't specifically mention the CIA. Uh, is, that, is there a reason for that? Is by saying there's authority, did that just necessarily capture uniform or civilian uh, operators? Uh, what's your feeling there? And should he have? And will they need to further cl clarify? I think that part of the difficulty is that although uh, Director Panetta is all over the newspapers deliberately in order to give information about the campaign that is taking place in Pakistan and, and elsewhere, uh, it's never actually been officially admitted, and so I think that the difficulty for the State Department is how do you wind up providing official overt legal blessing to something that the agency itself doesn't formally admit actually takes place. And I, I believe that this has actually reached a counterproductive point for the CIA. I think that we actually need to define a body of operations in which it is denied and deniable and not acknowledged um, as such, but is not regarded as though it were covert and yet the director is in the newspapers talking about it. I think that we actually need to define some uh, area between those things in order to be able to talk precisely about these kinds of legal and, and policy issues. Uh, so I think that there would actually be a great deal of utility in, in inviting representatives from the intelligence agencies to come and talk about how they classify these things. And I would be very interested in what Professor Banks has to say in particular about this because I think he's got much more experience. But I think the failure to mention the CIA is largely on account of the fact that there's been no explicit acknowledgement of it. I think it needs to be named. I think the CIA needs that protection and somebody needs to invite them to do that. Well, that was before going to Professor Banks on that. If you were a defense attorney uh, defending uh, either a uniform or, un you know, or a civilian operator of drones, would you feel comfortable enough that the statement from the administration gives uh, your client sufficient coverage there? I feel comfortable that it does give sufficient coverage, um, but I also think that it's kind of missing the point in a certain way. We know what's going on. It's acknowledged. It's out there on the table. And I think that it has to be discussed in order to lay out clearly what the legal rules are. Um, I also think that, I mean, if I were a defense attorney, I would certainly assert that. Um, I think that speaking as a neutral professor, I think that it needs to be said. I think that the CIA personnel need to know what the views of the political branches are on this and need to have it clearly and explicitly stated. They cannot be left in the limbo, so to speak, of having even a small amount of uncertainty as to whether their actions are regarded as lawful or not. If Professor O'Connell's views about this are right, somebody should say so and make that policy. If the views that I've of articulator to write that needs, but the uncertainty needs to be taken away here. Mr. Banks? 
I agree uh, with Professor Anderson that greater clarity for the role of the intelligence community in this area would be uh, a positive development. I think, you know, clearly uh, Mr. Coe was speaking on behalf of the State Department and he was articulating what he said to be his view of the international legality of these operations, but, but he made reference not only, of course, to international law and the laws of armed conflict, but also to the Constitution of the United States and the President's powers, as well as the authorization for the use of military force. He did not, of course, refer to the intelligence laws that I've spoken about here this morning, and I think that's regrettable. And in part, I believe it's for the reasons that Ken suggested that they aren't, uh, they don't illuminate the issues or, or supply the criteria that we might have to begin to evaluate these operations. Some kind of a middle ground that Professor Anderson suggests between uh, Deniable and, and Mr. Panetta in the newspapers I think might be a helpful development. I think we really do owe our CIA um, operatives very good and clear legal advice. I think they were let down very badly by the advice with regard to interrogation tactics, and I think they're being let down now if they're being told that the drone operations are lawful. It's one thing to develop a theory within the United States that could somehow justify it and that you've heard from my colleagues today. It's another thing in terms of what foreign countries believe especially where those CIA agents are operating in Pakistan, Afghanistan, or other countries. And in those countries, I am confident that the position I presented to you is the one that is held there. So our CIA agents who are involved in this um, activity are in jeopardy. We have 17 CIA agents who are under indictment in Italy for uh, kidnapping. And at any time, if, we, if the Pakistani authorities decide that they're no longer friendly to us, the Imani authorities, they can arrest and put on trial for murder persons involved in the CIA and these killings. That position should be clarified to our agents. It's one thing that we believe we are right in our theories. It's another thing what the rest of the world thinks, and I believe that our agents are in serious jeopardy. Thank you. Yeah, I don't think I Congress can certainly clarify it as a matter of domestic law and, and help the CIA folks out that way. But I think as a matter of international law to participate in a killing, the best you can hope for is to have the belligerent or combatant's privilege and immunity under the international law of war. But that we can only confer upon our uniformed military personnel. So I don't think there's anything that we can do that as a matter of international law or as a matter of the laws of other countries uh, is going to get the CIA folks out of the risk of some sort of foreign prosecution. I would add to that, I'm sorry to take more time on this, but I would add to that that Spain, for example, has been moving to alter its uh, law and universal jurisdiction. And I had conversations with some uh, people in Spain that were connected to that process and said, was that because of U.S. pressure that was brought about concerns about bringing prosecutions exactly of this kind that Italy has brought? And the answer was no. The answer was um, nobody really thinks that the U.S.'s view is important because it will never wind up backing it up. And what matters is actually that we are concerned that China uh, will be upset with this and that it would wind up cutting us off from contracts. And so I think that there are political avenues by which the United States can make it much, much more costly um, in order for foreign countries to be able to go after its personnel in that way. And that when the U.S. has formulated a view about what it thinks is the proper view of international law on that, it has political avenues that it is able to pursue, and it should be doing so. But as things stand right now, every single one of you thinks that a, uh, a CIA person in country X that's not Afghanistan or Pakistan or whatever, manipulating uh, unmanned aerial vehicles and killing uh, people with them is liable under international law for arrest and prosecution. Do we all agree to that? You do not. Okay. You think that they're somehow immune? I think it depends very much on where they're doing it and that if one's talking about Afghanistan or Pakistan. No, um, I excluded those. Oh, sorry. Then it depends again on where it is they were doing it in relation to international law. Um, they may be liable under domestic law and that's one of the reasons that the CIA as a civilian agency is a civilian agency that we have concluded as a country as other states have 
that we need to have a civilian capacity for covert action. Whether that's a good idea or a bad idea is another question, but we have decided that we need a capacity for covert action that can involve civilian agents involved in violations of the domestic laws of other countries. And that may be a terrible idea, and maybe the Church Commission should have pushed that all the way to the point of saying that will never happen again as a matter of U.S. law. But as it stands, it is lawful under domestic law, even if it is unlawful under the law, local law of the place in which those agents are operating. And that's one of the conditions that separates the CIA from the military. And it may be a very bad policy or it may be a very good policy, but as a matter of law, that's, I think, where it stands. Thank you. Mr. Foster. Thank you. Um, uh, do any of you know whether uh, an adequate historical record, <clears throat> excuse me, historical record is being made of the activities of, of drones? You know, who signed off on which, on which actions? No idea. No. Okay. Um, and just, I'm just sort of looking at the, the mirror image problem and the, um, well, for example, if, let's say the Taliban had the technology um, to launch a drone attack on the operators of the drones that are attacking them, um, so that would it be um, legitimate under international law and U.S. Um, policies for, you know, some Taliban that had the technology to go and launch drones? Um, you know, at, first off at the control bunkers in Nevada or wherever they are, and or at the um, homes of where the, the operators live um, that do this um, with under the same set of standards that we apply to um, taking out those. Ab ones. Absolutely. Um, the, the drones the operators are essentially fulfilling a combatant function. Um, and so it's my interpretation is that they then become um, combatants. Now, of course, the CIA people, we might argue that they are civilians and therefore they have fallen to the direct participating in hostilities um, standard, um, but certainly they're fulfilling such a, a military role that uh, they're pretty liable. But the military people, you know, definitely, I mean, if we are in an armed conflict, then the rules that govern armed conflict are supposed to apply even-handedly to both sides. And just as we can target, we can, in fact, be targeted in turn. And I disagree with that because I don't see the United States as the scene of an armed conflict, so there would be no right for others to bring battlefield weapons to this country. Um, if they, the, the right of persons in Afghanistan to resist our efforts, the persons who are trying to topple Hamid Karzai, they have the right to fight lawfully and to push the United States out of their country there. But no, no so one so has the, the right. So the joystick operators, it's where the, the explosion takes that, place and not right. where the joystick is operated. W w um. If the, the persons in the CIA who are in the United States are committing unlawful activities because they have no right to kill in that setting, but that's a, a crime under international law. It's not, it's not something that allows another person, another group to come and use battlefield weapons here. We sh they should follow law enforcement procedures and make complaints to the United States. Of course, they're in no position to do that. So, no, I mean, I, I really respect the battlefield, and I, do, and I would never say that, that any of these groups who are fighting us and have the right to fight us in Afghanistan, for example, if they're carrying weapons openly and uh, displaying that they are members of an organized armed group, they have the right under international law to fight us there. Uh, but they don't have the right to follow that here. There's no necessity to bring that fight here, and they don't have the right even to attack persons who are um, uh, committing So, so you think command and conduct. control centers generally outside the field of combat are, are off limits from your no, point of view? No, there's under, under uh, international law governing the use of force, there's the principle of necessity says that you can only use that armed force that's necessary to accomplish the military objective. The, the battle that we are fighting in Afghanistan now is to rid that country of insurgents. So um, to the, the limits on necessity in terms of what those insurgents can do have to do with our operations there. And I would not say, um, there, there is some disagreement, I admit that this is not as clear a view, but it is part of the modern growing tr tr trend toward focusing on necessity. So even I would say a command and control center outside the zone of armed conflict, away, far away from the battlefield. And of course, that conflict in Afghanistan is being run by Afghanistan. We are there at their invitation, so we're not really the command and control in terms of international law. So no, I, I think this country should be protected from those kinds of battlefield attacks. Well, that's contrary to the Supreme Court's decision in Kieran. Yeah. Um, and it's contrary to the law of war as nations understand it. Because when a nation goes to war with another nation, 
the, the two places that are clearly legitimate theaters of military operation are the territory of those belligerent parties. And in Kieran, the Nazi saboteurs, the issue, the legal issue was not that Germans came to the United States to blow up war industries. The Supreme Court basically indicates in the decision that had they kept their uniforms, they had every right to do that. That it was the fact that they shed their uniforms and buried them on the beach and tried to blend in with our civilian population that made them unlawful combatants. So I don't believe that the United States can shelter itself from counterattack by launching missiles from our own territory. Under Professor O'Connell's theory, we can fire ballistic missiles from the United States or we can fire cruise missiles from far offshore, and yet because those individuals are not on the battlefield, uh, as she defines it, they're, they're immune from military attack. And this would be a theory that would be wonderful for the United States military, but it's simply not the law. We're not at war with Afghanistan. We currently, since, since uh, Hamid Karzai took over, we are there at their invitation. So no, they are not uh, launching attacks. They're, the state of Afghanistan, the state of Pakistan are not at war with the United States. We are assisting them in putting down insurgencies. So this theater of operations are in those countries under the leadership of those governments. So this has nothing to do with Kieran, in which we were at war with Germany, another state that had sent those individuals here. Not to mention that that is old law, but the, the, it has nothing to do with the current situation that we're talking about. We are not at war with Pakistan or Afghanistan or Yemen. All right. So if they had declared war on us, you know, in whatever um, category, then 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 that would give them the right to um, to go after our in drone the, In the first phases of the after October 7, 2001, when we went to war with Afghanistan, when we took the fight there, if they had been capable of making counterattacks onto this territory, of course they could do that in self-defense or in a war of, uh, with the United States. The same with Iraq. In March 2003, when we launched an attack on the state of Iraq, yes, Iraq, if they had had the capability, they could have la launched a counterattack on us. Our leaders should always remember that when they attack foreign countries, that it can come to the homeland. But in both cases, our forces were far too strong and protected the homeland. It didn't come to that. But in Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, we are not at war with those countries. We are okay. in support of their um, leadership. Do, do any, anyone else have any comments on this? Uh, I disagree almost entirely with the analysis that's been presented. But I would actually make a slightly different comment, which is I think it's very important for the subcommittee here to understand just both how much support there is for the various views if one goes to the international law community outside the United States or one goes to national security scholars here within this country and that there is really a sense of ships passing in the night here in which the consequences of one view or another are really serious. We're talking about criminal law. We're talking about acts of things that could be potentially considered as murder by the people that are carrying them out. and how one reconciles those things or doesn't reconcile them it really matters. I mean, it, it matters as a matter of deep criminal law in this. My view on this particular issue is to agree with Professor Glazer with one additional point, which is we have long said, and I think correctly so, that where we are dealing with a terrorist group, that that terrorist group doesn't actually have any right to be taking up arms at all. And so the idea that there's a reciprocal right to be able to come after this, it would be the view that the British had when the IRA said, we're going to adhere strictly to the laws of war and we're just going to go after British soldiers in some base somewhere abroad. The view of the British correctly was, this is a terrorist group and they have no right to be taking up arms against us in any form. And that will all be considered criminal and our view of al-Qaeda would be exactly the same way, that, that the fact that we are launching attacks on them doesn't actually give them the right to launch attacks on us. It's not reciprocal in that way because of the nature of the group. I think it, it matters very much how we define the armed conflict. If, you know, Professor O'Connell's view is correct, that we are simply now in a non-international armed conflict in Afghanistan. In other words, if the conflict is simply between Afghanistan and remnants of the Taliban, and we are now there entirely at their invitation, that does make a difference. Um, but I think that we're still in the armed conflict that Congress constitutionally authorized in the authorization of use of military force. And so I think that the United States is still essentially having the right to, count, to combat the Taliban and al-Qaeda in our own right. Um, but if we do so, then the, the flip side of that is it makes us liable to attack um, ourselves. I would also suggest that there is an, you know, an alternative. I mean, one 
choice is to use this paradigm of the law of armed conflict. Um, but another paradigm is sort of the piracy, or essentially I think it's the way that, that Britain chose to treat the IRA, where because of the robustness of the threat, it's considered to be beyond the scope of what ordinary law enforcement agencies can deal with and military force is required. That's exactly how pirates were treated historically. But it was essentially conducted under laws much more akin to law enforcement rules so that the military was under an obligation, even with pirates, little known, but they didn't just shoot pirates first and ask questions later. They at least made an effort to capture them, and when they were captured, then they were dealt with under a law enforcement paradigm and brought home for trial uh, under the constitutional provisions that govern a normal civilian trial. Uh, and so that is an option that, that's available to this government as a policy choice uh, to choose to treat terrorists essentially as pirates or as terrorists have been treated in the past, using the military under, under constraints that are much more akin to law enforcement than to law of war. I think David Glazier is uh, exactly right, and, and we've really come to uh, a crunch point. Are we in an, uh, armed conflicts in Afghanistan, Iraq right now? Is this country, is that where we are engaged in armed conflict? Or are we really actually in an armed conflict all over the world with these non-state actors? I just suggest to you again that, there, that the international lawyers who are specialists in this law around the world do not view it this way. Our armed forces know they're in an armed conflict in Afghanistan and in Iraq. Um, that's the reality. Thank you all. Um, Mr. Welch, any more questions? Uh, just an observation. I think that what you are saying now, the panel, uh, goes to the heart of a challenge for us in Congress. Much of the analysis depends on what the nature of the conflict is, whether it's a police action, and as I understand it, many other countries that have been faced with uh, terrorist threats and uh, have been the recipient of uh, consequences of those threats have defined it more as a police action. Uh, our country has defined it uh, as an international global war on terror, uh, and that really guides analysis uh, as much as anything else. So I appreciate the, uh, all your contributions here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you. I think you've exhausted the, uh, the panel up here. We, uh, we have a lot of different things to mull over and, and uh, we continue to read. Uh, the ACLU uh, statement has just come in, and I'll share that with the other members of the committee as well. Uh, do any of you have any, any final word that you want to leave with us? I would, I would uh, say that the, the metaphor that, that Professor Anderson used just now is quite apt, that ships passing in the night, the different legal paradigm here. And it, as Professor O'Connell just said, the prospect of asymmetric war with non-state actors it does not fit neatly within any of the paradigms that have been discussed here today. And it, it would behoove, I think, the Congress to grapple with the possibility of making adaptations or recognizing new dimensions of legal uh, oversight that could allow us to uh, adapt the laws that we've been working with for more than 200 years to this new era of warfare. Do you have any of those uh, adaptations in mind in particular? I, I have a few. I think that considerable uh, oversight improvement could be made in the area of intelligence that we've been speaking about here today. And I think back to areas that are off today's topic, I think there's considerable work that's being done in the academic community and elsewhere on changes in detention, uh, classification of fighters, uh, targeting, and the like that uh, deserve congressional attention. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to offer the thought that um, I've tried to focus my remarks today on, on the law. Um, and as has been noted by, by particularly Professor O'Connell, there are real policy uh, issues at, at stake as well. My personal belief is that in, in confronting these threats, that, that the law of war is not an adequate solution, that there are for many reasons, including the fact that we need uh, to engage in activities in other friendly countries, uh, even European countries, you know, where there may be terrorist cells, uh, we are dependent to a large measure on using criminal law uh, in its, its standard form, and we're dependent on international cooperation. So it seems to me that one of the most important reasons to try to ground our conduct across the board in an area of law 
is to facilitate that international cooperation and to lay the groundwork for the ability to call upon, even to demand upon other nations to cooperate with us in this effort. We have, for example, a whole series of terrorism treaties which basically require international cooperation in the field. Where we choose to exclusively treat this as an armed conflict, though, we give other countries the right, essentially, to step outside the scope of those terrorism treaties and say, look, the United States is at war. You know, we don't have to cooperate with you in an armed conflict. Um, but if we don't conduct those portions of the operations that we choose to, to consider to be an armed conflict in accordance with that law, I think we damage our, our credibility and we impair cooperation in those areas that we do want to treat under the law of criminal Well stated. I want to echo what Mr. Duncan said, that we shouldn't exaggerate what al-Qaeda is. There was a report on National Public Radio on Monday of this week that, in fact, al-Qaeda is losing significant report, support in the Muslim world because of their lawlessness, because of their violence. And I firmly believe that we, the United States, can help bring about the final demise of al-Qaeda through our commitment to the rule of law, especially by strict compliance with rules governing the use of lethal force. We have rules. They are in place. We shouldn't try to manipulate them, to reinterpret them, to find loopholes in them, to say that they're quaint, obsolete, no longer of use to this country. We should uphold them, we should honor them, and we should distinguish ourselves from our enemies by our commitment to them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I joined Professor Banks in uh, particularly in what he said about oversight, and I would also again reiterate um, uh, my support for uh, Dean Coe's statement, uh, I think that it provided a very solid base for the United States to go forward, and I think that there are ways in which the Congress could build on those and invite the administration to elaborate those more further, starting in the first place with specifically identifying the CIA as, as uh, an actor in this. At the end of the day, I believe that it's not about drones. I think that it's really a question about uh, the proper role of the CIA in this, the proper role of covert action, the proper role of the use of advanced technologies by actors that may be outside of the military. And I think those are enormously important policy and legal choices that the Congress will have to confront. Well, all of us are, are grateful for your, uh, your intellect and, and your time uh, and your ideas that you've shared with us. And I want to thank you. I can only imagine that the people that study uh, in your classes must enjoy being there and, and must get a lot out of it. So thank you very much. Uh, and again, we uh, always try to hold up the prospect that if we need to come back to you for your advice and consent, we're hoping that you'll welcome that. Uh, and again, thank you all very much. This meeting is adjourned.